So now that you're all seated and you're all comfortable, please stand with me to read God's word. Take your Bibles, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 18 through 25. Very well-known verses. It's Christmas time. I'm preaching through 1 Peter right now, and so I've got that on my mind, but uh, I really want to preach this today because this is very appropriate. The tree's up, I believe. I didn't go last night, but the tree's up, right? It's all decorated. Uh, a Christmas uh, sales have been going on, I think, for six months. So, <laughs> Cyber Week. No longer Cyber Monday, it's Cyber Week, and it's Black Friday month, I guess, something like that. Okay. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Lord God, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things in your word today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I want you to see today the wondrous mystery of God incarnate. How it ought to make a difference in our lives and in our households and in our ministries, in our relationships. How God brings about the greatest good through something that is mysterious and even unsettling. There's a question we always ask ourselves. I ask myself often, how could something that looks so bad be so good? There are a lot of things that you could point out to. How a situation, a crisis that seems out of place, incongruous with a happy and peaceful life, how God can use to bring about his greatest glory and our eternal good. How can the many mysteries of life be solved? How can things that fill up the front page news really be used for God's good and God's glory and and our good? Think of Ferguson protest, think of Middle East crisis and upheaval, ongoing political unrest worldwide. How can those be a tool that God can use for the gospel to go to more people. We become fearful, we become impatient, we we become worried and anxious. So you think of things like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and every other crisis. I think of a massive hacking that took down a huge company's computer network just the other day. I think of identity thieves that steal millions of people's personal info. How can God use all that? Bring it closer to home. How are you going to get through this week? How are you going to get through the next two to three weeks of school and all the things you have on your plate? Or how are you going to have that difficult conversation you need to have this afternoon? How is that fractured relationship ever going to be mended? In the face of so many uncertainties in life, and I would say mysteries is a good way to put it, we can become fearful and anxious and impatient, wanting God to act and thinking that we know the better plan. So I think a really good look at the mystery of God incarnate will help solve some of those issues for us because it should make a difference in our lives. When I became a believer, I was almost 20 years old and, 
and I had been singing some of these hymns, like the hymn we sang this morning, but I hadn't known Christ. I hadn't bowed before his throne until I was almost 20 years old, and it was a, a revolutionary thing to me that the word of God is true and that Jesus is God, because I had been told both those things weren't. I want you to see this wonderful mystery of God incarnate because this mystery is puzzling and can be confusing and somewhat unsettling, but if we enter the biblical world to understand how God can use the most atrocious looking things for his greatest glory and our eternal good, maybe we can also see how that can happen in our lives right now. I think of Joseph and Mary. Luke is talking about Mary and so Matthew is talking about Joseph and the perspective of the birth of Christ, the, the genesis of Jesus, the, the start of, of the God-man here on earth. And it starts in verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ, the genesis of Jesus Christ took place in this way. His mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph and before they came together, before they had a physical union, she was found to be pregnant. Now at this point, it would have been three or four months pregnant, and it was very obvious. You couldn't, you couldn't hide the fact that, that she was with child. And it says in verse 18 that she was with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people have labored strenuously to deny that truth. A lot of people have labored very, very strenuously to argue that, that Jesus didn't even claim to be God. One, one noted writer in the, in, the, in the 1970s, actually, I think it was 77, John Hick uh, wrote a book called the, the Metaphor of God Incarnate, and, and he clearly denied that, that Jesus is God. And, but here is what he, what he also said. He said, if, if, if Jesus was indeed God incarnate, Christianity is the only religion founded by God in person. And as such must be uniquely superior to all other religions. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, John says. Peter, now I'm preaching through 1 Peter, but in 2 Peter, Peter, who is an eyewitness, flatly denies that he followed a myth. People like Hick and others would say, well, you got, you're believing a myth here. It has no bearing on your life today. I'm here to tell you that the the incarnation has, has probably the most bearing on your life today than any other biblical doctrine. Peter says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories, myths, when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Paul warned Timothy that some would follow myths rather than the truth. For the time will come, he says in 2 Timothy 4, when, when men will put, not put up with sound doctrine, but they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn to myths. Instead of claiming that Jesus is the myth of God incarnate, he claims that Jesus is God's mystery. Paul claims that Jesus is the mystery hidden from long ages. And all that is deepest in God is mysteriously summed up in Christ. There were false teachers then, there are false teachers now that would try to deceive believers by claiming that they have a better source of wisdom and knowledge and that you should jettison the truth of the Bible for, for human wisdom. All of us are, are facing that pull. None of us are immune to questioning the, the veracity and the authority and of God's word. But the mystery has been revealed. In fact, Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. And he begins by saying that Jesus appeared in a body. God incarnate. Paul had just finished saying that the church was the pillar and foundation of the truth. And now he gives Timothy a foundational truth for the church. The mystery of God was made manifest in the flesh. It's a mystery that's been revealed. It's about a birth, the birth of God in the flesh, God incarnate. Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. She was betrothed to Joseph, binding as modern marriage, 
a divorce was necessary to terminate the betrothal. They were legally considered husband and wife, although physical union had not taken place yet. Luke tells us in chapter 2 that the child was of the Holy Spirit. This bedrock truth, this, this mystery hidden for ages, now clearly revealed, 2014, this is not a surprise for us to be hearing this today, that, that, that Jesus is the God-man, God incarnate. It's been believed by the church through the ages. The, the creeds of the church, the Nicene Creed, Back in the 300s, it was written this way. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. The Chalcedonian Creed ironed out some difficulties that G people had with Jesus. 451 AD, we all with one accord teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead, and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his manhood like us in all respects, apart from sin, as regards his Godhead begotten of the Father before the ages, but yet as regards his manhood begotten for us men and for our salvation of Mary the Virgin, the God-bearer. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? The answer, Christ the Son of, man be the Son of God became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her yet without sin. Donald Gray Barnhouse said this, but what shall we say to the giving birth of the Messiah who was the mighty God? Emmanuel, God with us. Here all world's words fail us. In vain does the imagination attempt to grasp so wonderful an event. God manifest in the flesh. How great this mystery of godliness and how infinitely ennobled are that people to whom the ever-blessed God is so nearly related. Wayne Grudem says it is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. Far more amazing than the resurrection and more amazing even than the creation of the universe. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become a man and join himself to a human nature forever so that infinite God became one person with finite man will remain for eternity the most profound miracle, the most profound mystery in all the universe. The wondrous mystery of God incarnate. Charles Wesley said it well, our God contracted in a span incomprehensibly made man. Verse 19 tells us that Joseph being a just man, he was a true believer unwilling to put her to shame, dissolved to divorce her quietly. Stoning would be the legal prescription in those days for the sort of adultery, but Joseph's righteousness meant that he was merciful and he did not intend to make Mary a public example. She was already a public spectacle. He was a just man, and he considered these things. Verse 20, think of all the things you're considering in, in your heart today. Think of all the things that are going on in your life, things that are, have, have maybe drug you down, things that have appeared, uh, things that have been here in your life for a long time. Think of the things that you are considering and the course of action you are considering because of the things that are in your life and in your heart. Think of the considerations that, that you are that you are uh, rolling around in your head of, of, of a way to react to whatever it is that either just happened in your life or, or even happened a long time ago and you're still struggling. Verse 20 says, he considered these things. What was he considering? He was going to divorce Mary. That was what he was going to do. But it's very clear that it was the will of God that he marry Mary. Very clear. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. In Matthew's gospel, 
which I got to preach through for five years, 168 sermons. I know there's one person in the room that's very glad to hear this. Mike Wilkins loves the fact that I did that. I benefited greatly from his writings um, on discipleship and, and all he wrote on regarding Matthew. But there are five dreams from angels in this, in this context, and this is the biggest. Here, here's, the, here's this angel appearing to Joseph in a dream. And I know if someone walks up to you and says, hey, I had this dream, and I think God was telling me this, you know, you kind of think, eh, that you're a little bit weird. Um, you know, maybe you had some bad cheese last night, I don't know. But God appears to him in a dream and, and, and says this, Joseph, son of David, so the lineage is, is right in line there, and do not fear. There's the fear. He's, he's fearing to take Mary as his wife. He doesn't want to put her to shame, so he's just going to just, he's going to walk away. Seems like the best course of action. Seems like, it seems like a good idea. The best idea in a bad situation. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. You, some people don't want to take the word of God at face value. Joseph, Joseph is hearing this. And, and, then, and then the angel says, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means savior. It's, it's the Greek version of Joshua, Hebrew Joshua. And, and he's, this angel is saying Jesus is gonna save his people from their sins. Back in those days, they were waiting for the Messiah, but they were waiting for a, a, a political Messiah that would free them from oppression of Rome, and they were thinking of things of, of, of how, what this Messiah would do, but to save them from their sins was not on their minds. Verse 22 tells us all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Matthew is pointing out fulfillments to Old Testament prophecy 12 times in his gospel. He quotes the Old Testament more times than, than most writers in the New Testament. 60 times he quotes the Old Testament more than any other New Testament writer except for Paul in Romans. It took place to fulfill what God had spoken through the prophet Isaiah, verse 23. It says this, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God's, God with us. Scholars have sparred for years over whether the Hebrew term in Isaiah 7:14 means virgin or maiden. Matthew is quoting here very in the unambiguous Greek term for virgin and he's writing under the Holy Spirit's inspiration and he's ending all doubt about the meaning of the word. Emmanuel, the mighty God God with us, and he is saying that Jesus is God with us. So verse 24 and 25, you see the reaction. Joseph wakes up from his sleep. He does as the angel tells him to do. He takes his wife, but he knew her not. That's a euphemism for sexual union. He knew her not until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Eight days after he was born, when it was time for him to be circumcised, Joseph gave him the name Jesus. So why does the incarnation matter so much to us? What is this mystery of mysteries? Why is it so big? It's because of this. In the redemptive history, in, re in the redemptive plan of God, this is the crowning act God the Son, without ceasing to be God, became man. Galatians 4.4 4 tells us that the fullness, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law. What's the big deal about the incarnation? Well, first, what it does is it reveals God to man. The glorious grace of God is seen here that God is being revealed to man in the person of Jesus Christ. What does Hebrews 1 say? Hebrews chapter 1. 
Verse one, long ago, out many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The incarnation reveals God to us and the glorious grace of God, but it also shows us that Jesus came to redeem fallen man. If you're a believer today, and by the way, you say, whoa, 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 whoa. do you remember where you're at? You're speaking at Talbot Chapel, you got a bunch of undergrads and grads all in the same room, Biola students, Bible Institute of Los Angeles students, Talbot students. I read the book about Louis Talbot, For This I Was Born, great book. So why did you say if you're a Christian? Because I have seen in, I can't do the math now. I don't know, I think it's 34 years of being a, a believer and uh, however many years of ministry I've been in since 1985, whatever, that, whatever the math is, 29 years, I have seen far too many people proclaim faith in Christ, profess faith in Christ, and then throw it all away. Right now on, on my prayer list, my virtual prayer list, I have got a former Talbot student and his wife who were missionaries who are now atheists, claiming to be atheists, living several hours away from us right here. I know of many others that have professed faith in Christ, but, but for some reason or another, buckled, caved in, gave up, said Jesus didn't work. They weren't ever captured by the mystery, the glorious wondrous mystery of God incarnate. See, Jesus came to redeem fallen man. I like the way Layman Strauss put it. Had there been righteousness in the human heart, there would have been no need for the incarnation of the Son of God. In the self-righteous heart of the religious moral man, satisfied with himself, we find the careless indifference to the gospel of the grace of God in Christ. We find careless indifference to the wondrous mystery of God incarnate who came to redeem fallen man. There's something else about the incarnation that I need to point out to you though. It wasn't just to reveal God to us and it wasn't just to redeem fallen man, but it was also to deliver his people and destroy Satan, to bring us peace. Hebrews points this out even, even more clearly in chapter two, it says, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for everyone, for as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took, play, took part of the same, flesh and blood, God incarnate, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You got these names in Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Jesus Christ, the Savior, the anointed Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. You've got God with us. You've got God for us in saving us. God very clearly says, Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Luke 2 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I got my first Christmas card, I think, just yesterday. At least it was the first one I opened up. My family gets to them. I always look and see if there's a gift card or cash, but no one sends that in Christmas cards. It's just a card, a real card, not a virtual one, but in the mail, relatives from Tennessee. I didn't bring it with me. It's in my car. I was going to show you. It's a beautiful picture little country church, little, there's a little glitter on the card, I think, even, and it says, joy to the world. Like, awesome. But that's not how everybody's life looks. You know, Christmas doesn't look like that for a lot of people. First Christmas didn't look like that for Joseph and Mary. People accused him of being born of fornication. In fact, that's what they said in John, I believe it's 841. We weren't born of, of fornication. They were digging at Jesus. You know, some people get bounced around like a ping pong ball from one crisis to another in their lives. That might be you. You might be um, 
you might be um, really confused in life. Well, mysteries are puzzling and confusing and unsettling and they're tricky. You might have a bunch of mysteries going on in your life. Again, how am I gonna get through this next couple weeks? How am I gonna pay the school bill? How am I gonna get through that difficult relationship? What's gonna happen? Who am I gonna marry? Where am I gonna work? Where am I supposed to live? All the things we worry about all day long sometimes. Things aren't always what they seem like. They don't all look like the front of a, of a real Christmas card. There's Joseph, and um, he believes in a fulfillment, not a farce, not a falsehood. He's clinging to that. He, he takes the mystery, not a myth, Jesus, God who saves, Emmanuel, God with us. Joseph's like, I'm there. I think about Joseph and Mary a lot at Christmas time, and you think about Mary and Luke, and it was God's grace that moved her heart to receive the news she heard before conception. And it was grace that moved Joseph's heart after after this baby had been conceived. Grace moves hearts. The grace of God has appeared, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and live righteously and godly in Christ Jesus. See, Joseph was able to see a glory greater than what the surface saw. And it's summed up in that wondrous beauty. I like how Colossians 1.27 puts it, Christ in you the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you might today be filled with fear. What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? There's a proverb, and I can't remember where it is, but it says, through presumption comes nothing but strife. Presumption is the what ifs of life. You're gonna live on the what ifs, you'll have only strife. You might be impatient today. You're waiting for something that you think God has promised you. Maybe you're waiting for something that God has truly promised you. And, and your timetable is, is on a, you know, ticks faster than God's. <laughs> your, your heart's beating faster for it than, than God's is. You, you, you want something and you're not getting it and you're, you're impatient and so you're kind of tempted to just throw in the towel and maybe get it in the way that you know you could get it. Maybe you're worried about everything in life. You're a- anxious, you're I don't know, so many people get anxious about grades. I tell them, don't worry about the grade. They're like, you, you don't have to carry the report card home. I say, yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> but you're not even, you don't care what's on my report card at this point, right? Do not fear. But what if? What if? What if? Well, can you see God's grace in the gory details of your life. Joseph had a a gory detail going on. He was gonna take a pregnant woman for his wife, and he didn't make her pregnant. That would have been shame enough. Can you see mercy in your misery? Can you see the peace of God that passes all understanding when you are in the pit? Jesus is God with us who saves. Jesus is God with us who saves. That's the big deal. That's the, that's the wondrous mystery of, of God incarnate. So you're impatient. You need the grace of God to move your heart. So you, um, you're fearful. You need mercy. You're anxious, you're worried, you need peace. The God-man stands ready. Jesus, God with us who saves to will and do his good pleasure. This, This should make a difference in how we live our lives today. Here's what Joseph did. He submitted to what he heard and for us, it's like this. I'm coaching basketball, by the way. I've coached a lot of kids' sports. 
coaching my 11-year-old and my 13-year-old in basketball right now. And I'm instituting an offense. It goes, it goes like this. Here's what it's called. Read and react. Read and react. It's really simple. Read what's happening, you react to it. See what the defense is giving you? You react to it. What I see Joseph doing is, is reading and reacting. He listened, he heard, and he reacted. What does God want you to do today? Read the word and react by submitting your entire life to God's good purposes. That you can, hopefully you can see very clearly in this wondrous mystery of God incarnate how that ought to make a difference in your life that God's been revealed. That Jesus is saving his people and he, he came to defeat Satan. He came to deliver his people. The glory, the Christ in you, your hope of glory, lasts forever. You can get through what you're going through today. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.